I'm Elaine Smith, the Artistic Director of the Clamor Theatre Company. We're holding these creative conversations with playwrights, with actors, with directors, so that you can find out more about Clamor Theatre and about the artists who work with us. Welcome to this edition of a Clamor Creative Conversation. Today, we're talking with Michael John McGoldrick, whose play Backstage Fairy Tale is going to be read on September 12th as part of our Zoom reading series. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Elaine. It's great to be here. So please introduce yourself and tell our viewers a little bit about your background and bio. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm a New Jersey playwright. Uh, I live in uh, Jersey City. Uh, I've been writing plays for a little over 10 years. Uh, I have a degree in uh, dramatic writing from ASU, Arizona State University, which is a great experience. Uh, and um, just love all things theater, love all things cultural. Um, I'm a big skier, I'm a big bike rider. Um, I teach high school English, that's my day job. Try to find as much time as I can to write plays. That's, a, that's pretty much me in a nutshell, so. Okay, good. So let's talk a little bit about Backstage fairy tale without giving away any spoilers, but what, okay. uh, what should we know about that before we sure. read it? Sure. Well, I um, would say that this is a play, uh, first of all, it's a relationship play. Uh, and so I think anybody, you know, everybody who has had or in a relationship uh, can uh, enjoy it on that basis. You know, it's a play about two people coming together to talk about who they were uh, and who they are, uh, people that know each other well. Uh, and so on that basis, um, I think it's for everybody. But in particular, my, my primary um, point of interest in this play was kind of analyzing the creative temperament. And what I feel is true, I know this is true about me and I, it's true about many people I know in the theater. And Elaine, this may be true of you, I don't know you very well. Uh, but what has often been the case for many creative people is that you know, people are driven to create art in some way because the regular world is, in some way is deficient for them or they feel out of touch or not at home in that world. Uh, or feel themselves to have some kind of deep inadequacy or lack. And so art becomes the place where like, uh, this makes sense, right? Um, so the play is about two people who meet and uh, connect and admire in the other their success in that world, their ability to do that. And they're attracted to the ways in which I think for creative people, when you create the person who you are when you create in some sense is like an ascent, a window into the essence of who you really are, who you aspire to be. Uh, and so that's the basis of their attraction and their connection. But the problem is that the things that required you, that, that impelled you into the creative realm, those deficiencies or those lacks that I talked about before, don't go away. Uh, they're still very much there. Uh, and so these are two characters, what I want to, to explore is the way these two characters are both attracted to each other for their ability to create, but at the same time are hindered by the, the things in their lives, the, the deficiencies in their lives that have impelled them to do that in the first place. So that's a kind of thumbnail sketch into what I think the, I would like the play to be about. Okay, good. So now um, tell me, uh, people often answer this question with, oh, the one I'm working on right now. But my question <laughs> is, do you have a favorite play of your sure. own, and whether it's produced or unproduced, you know? Sure. So this, I am proud of this play and I, I encourage everyone, please come see this play. But I, I recently had a great, great writing opportunity um, during COVID uh, to work on another play of mine called Allies. Uh, and I've, uh, it's kind of a satire on uh, contemporary progressive politics and uh, corporate, uh, uh, corporate culture. And uh, I, I got this residency with a um, play development company called New, the New Jersey Play Lab. And I was slated to go up with them uh, starting in the spring of 2020 when COVID hit. And it actually turned it out to be in this respect, at least a kind of blessing because with nothing else to do, um, the artistic director and I were able to really work on the play in a very, very detailed way. Uh, and it was a great process. It was a long, thorough process. And the play is, 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 I'm very proud of where it is. And I'm in the process now of sending it out to 
theaters and hoping to find interest in it. But that definitely, I think, is uh, the play that I'm most proud of today. Good. Great. So um, it hasn't had a production yet because it's a new play. And right. uh, so we'll look forward to, to seeing it at some point. Um, so what are three favorite plays that you may have seen or read by other authors and yep. what do you like about them? Yeah. Uh, so I would start with Tom Stoppard's play, The Coast of Utopia. Uh, you know, Tom Stoppard, I think among living playwrights is the the most long lived, he's got the most wide ranging career and the Coast of Utopia, I'm a political, politically I'm a conservative in my political beliefs and we are few and far on the ground in the world of the theater. Uh, so what I really admire about the Coast of Utopia is that Stopper is able to write uh, from a conservative perspective in a way that is like um, interesting and, and one that doesn't alienate what is largely, you know, a liberal monoculture in the world of the theater. You know, he's embraced uh, by a great many theater practitioners. You know, he's not, he doesn't alienate people. He, he's able to, to present conservative ideas in a way that's appealing. And I think that's a great model. It's one that I aspire to. Um, so that's the first thing I'd say. Uh, the second thing I'd say is that um, I'm really a great fan of uh, Lynn Nottage and her play um, Fabulation, which not that many people know. Um, it's it's not one of her uh, her best, you know, well, mo it's, I actually I think it is one of her best plays. It's not a very well-known play, but it's a satire. It's a really, really lovely satire. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, the, the humor is, is incredibly wide ranging in a way that if you know her other plays or more famous plays, uh, will surprise you. Uh, so that's a play I'd mention. And then, uh, you know, just for fun, I'm just going to say that I had the occasion in 2018 to see um, a production of St. Joan, um, uh, George Bernard Saw's St. Joan on Broadway. And I never really cared for Shaw very much uh, until I saw this production and uh, it just really kind of blew me away. Uh, so I'll throw that one to the mix too. Great. I, I love this question because I just keep making longer and longer lists of things to read, you know, <laughs> although right. um, some of them I've read, you know, but uh, right. uh, that's great. So for our viewers, if you would like to read plays by Michael, you can look for them on the New Play Exchange website at newplayexchange.org. And if you would like to attend the free reading on Zoom of Michael's play Backstage Fairy Tale, which will be on September the 12th at 7 p.m. Eastern, you can make a reservation on Clamor's website, which is also the place to go for information on our other events. And you can find us on Facebook as Clamor Theater Company. We post all of those URLs in the description below. And if you would like to see more interviews like this one, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Michael, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today and letting our audience get to know something about you. We are really looking forward to the reading and we're very glad you have been able to join the Clamor community. As am I. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you.